Lizzie. So I binge researched yesterday the history of celibacy in the priesthood. In light of the Amazon Synod, I've been getting so many questions on my thoughts on married versus non-married priests. I've even gotten questions and comments of people saying they are leaving Catholicism if the ruling is for married priests in that region. Even when I was converting into Catholicism, my friends and my family asked me about celibacy in the priesthood and were concerned, even angry, that most of our priests are not married. We're going to read from the Bible, early church documents, church fathers, church councils, to really discover from a historical perspective when celibacy developed and why. This obsession and passion about celibacy goes back even into the Old Testament. It reaches its catalyst with Jesus and St. Paul and the Virgin Mary. The coolest thing is that the priesthood and deacons and bishops were choosing this all along. Hundreds of years before there were official mandates of celibacy in the Western Church, there were thousands of people in religious life who were excited to be celibate and to enter into singlehood to be fully devoted to Christ. Make sure to subscribe to my channel and click the bell button next to the subscribe button so that you can get notifications every time I upload a new video. And you'll also get notifications for when I'm about to live stream. So as I said in my recent live stream, I personally love that priests are unmarried because they get to be father figures to everyone at their parish. I feel so special that instead of the priest being focused on his children, he's focused on me and everyone else at my parish. So my parish Bible study actually meets in my priest's house in the rectory once a week at nighttime. And we have dinner and then Bible study and then we talk more. And if my priest had children, he would be helping them get to bed, cleaning the house more, helping his wife. And instead, he's free and he's able to fully interact with everyone at the parish. And the same thing on Sunday in between masses, we're able to just hang out, have RCIA, have breakfast together. Priests are so busy to you should talk to them at moments notice they might be called to the hospital someone is dying and they have to do daily mass sometimes multiple masses a day confession meeting one-on-one -on -one with people spiritual direction it's so special that he's completely undivided affairs to the Lord and to the parish family and he's following in Christ's example of being single and his entire life devoted to ministry. It's the most beautiful thing. I love unmarried priests and we're going to get into the history of it. So we're going to get to the Old Testament in a couple minutes but first I want to read what Jesus has to say about celibacy. Matthew 19 12 For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. So real quick, this is kind of graphic, but a eunuch is someone who is physically castrated, normally employed by a palace to watch over the female quarters. So physically, they're forced to be celibate. Eunuchs from birth, others are made eunuchs by others for employment, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. Cool story coming from this origin, this epic theologian who I personally think had bipolar disorder. He castrated himself, like he cut off his organ after reading this Bible verse of Jesus saying that let anyone accept this who wants to be a eunuch. But clearly Jesus isn't talking physically. He just means choosing to refrain from having sex and refrain from marriage and to be single in ministry like how Jesus was. He also actively tried to get killed when his dad was being martyred for the faith. He was trying to get murdered and his mom was begging him to not be unnecessarily killed for the faith. Origen is a genius though, and I pray that he is in heaven. He would be my patron saint if he was a saint, but he was a heretic. He believed that everyone was going to be in heaven 
including Satan and all the demons and all the angels who turned away from God. So we're going back even further into the Old Testament to share that the Jews at the time who were the members of the first Christian communities were influenced by these interpretations of the Old Testament. When a priest in the Old Testament was serving in the temple, he did not have sex with his wife. In addition, this Jewish scholar, Philo of Alexandria, who was writing in 20 BC to 50 AD, he shared a common Jewish interpretation of scripture that after Moses had the experience of encountering God in the burning bush, he never had sex with his wife Zipporah ever again. Another common Jewish interpretation was of number seven. Moses consecrates the temple and then a leader from every Israelite tribe brings a gift and presents it to God in the temple. And because it was in front of the consecrated altar somewhere so holy, once they went back to their families, they never had sex with their wives again. Regardless of whether or not these later interpretations were what actually happened at the time, it's just an example of the culture during the first century at the very beginning of the church. I don't think it's this idea that sex is bad, but that encountering God in this extreme amazing way is so much better and in this whole different realm than sex. I mean, we're not going to have sex in heaven, so it's kind of a foretaste of the extreme presence of God. So next, in the first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul in chapter 7, 5 through 9 is talking about celibacy and how it's so amazing to not get caught up in the affairs of the world. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a set time to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again. So he's saying to married couples to not stop having sex, to enjoy each other sexually. This I say by way of concession, not of command. I wish that all were as I myself am, so being single. To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is well for them to remain unmarried as I am. Let's go down to verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the impending crisis of Jesus coming back trying to evangelize the world, because at this point, they thought that Jesus was going to come back relatively soon, like within decades, not Christendom continued for 2000 years. They had no idea. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you do not sin. And if a virgin marries, she does not sin. Yet those who marry will experience distress in this life. And I would spare you that. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none. All of that speaks for itself. Continuing down to verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman and the virgin are anxious about the affairs of the Lord so that they may be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the affairs of the world and how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit not to put any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and unhindered devotion to the Lord. Catechism 1579 and 1580. All the ordained ministers of the Latin church, with the exception of permanent deacons, are normally chosen from among men of faith who live a celibate life and who intend to remain celibate for the sake of the kingdom of heaven called to consecrate themselves with undivided heart to the Lord and to the affairs of the Lord. They give themselves entirely to God and to men. Celibacy is a sign of this new life in the service of which the church's minister is consecrated. 
accepted with a joyful heart, celibacy radiantly proclaims the reign of God. In the Eastern Church, a different discipline has been enforced for many centuries. While bishops are chosen solely from among celibates, married men can be ordained as deacons and priests. This practice has long been considered legitimate. These priests exercise a fruitful ministry within their communities. Moreover, priestly celibacy is held in great honor in the Eastern churches, and many priests have freely chosen it for the sake of the kingdom of God. In the East, as in the West, a man who has already received the sacrament of holy orders can no longer marry. So if any of you are freaking out and so concerned that this could be changing everything with married priests, I hope that it comforts and states you to know that currently in the Catholic Church and for the entire history of Christianity, there have been married priests and unmarried priests. There's merit and there's worth and there's ministry happening in both. Namely, St. Peter and some of the other apostles were married, including Jesus' cousin. Philip is mentioned in Acts 21.9 as having four daughters who prophesied and are virgins. So it's so cool talking about Philip, how he is married, but then it says unmarried daughters who prophesied. So it's kind of implying that they are consecrated virgins for ministry. So more books in the New Testament. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's talking about qualifications for bishops, priests, and deacons. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once or the husband of one, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, and apt. I don't want to be clear, I'm saying bishop. It can also be translated as elder or overseer. The Greek is episkopon, which continues in early church documents like the letters of Saint Ignatius. When he's talking about bishops, he also uses the Greek word episkopon. Going down in 1 Timothy 3 verse 12, let deacons be married only once and let them manage their children and their households well. Up again to rules for bishops, it says in verse 4, he must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. So right here, verse 5 is an argument people use who are pro-married priests. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? And people make the same argument saying, how can a priest give relationship advice? How can a priest give parenting or marriage advice if they don't have a household? Completely false. There are objective things on how to have a healthy relationship and how to do parenting. I personally give so much marriage advice through my YouTube channel and people say that it has saved their marriages and helped their marriages so much. And I have zero experience being married. There are objective indicators of how to have a healthy relationship. So looking at these verses in 1 Timothy 3, it is not a mandate to be married. It's actually a mandate to only have been married once. So that means if you were married and then your wife died, not getting remarried. I always was so confused when I would read that verse growing up and I thought it was kind of something against polygamy, but polygamy was not an issue in the early church at the time. It's just saying to not be remarried, to only be married once, and divorce was completely forbidden. So this is talking about if your wife dies, don't get remarried if you're going to be a bishop or a deacon or a priest. But even if these verses were a mandate for marriage, even if there is a mandate for bishops to be able to manage their household well, St. Paul sets down argument against condemning sola scriptura just a few verses down. 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions of you so that if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. So the church is the truth. 
not scripture alone, but the church. And the church magisterium, the oral tradition, has the ability to make developments throughout church history. And I want to be really clear, these are developments in discipline, in how we are living out faith, but they are not ever developments or changes in the infallible dogmas and infallible theologies that Jesus and the apostles taught that have not changed since the first century. But things like whether or not priests are married are things that do change and can change. From our perspective of Western culture post-sexual revolution, it's this idea, why can't they have sex? They deserve to have sex, it's their right. But in the ancient world, during the time of the start of Christianity, it was this idea of, of course you don't have sex. I shared a lot of this in my video, Five Reasons Mary Was a Perpetual Virgin, and it was the same arguments where after experiencing God in the flesh, living in her, it didn't make sense for her and Joseph to have sex after that. They were living in a spiritual marriage where they were legally, economically married to each other, spouses, but never had sex. And this completely inspired and empowered the next few centuries of Christianity. In the Shepherd of Hermes, which is one of the earliest Christian documents, it talks about these spiritual marriages where two Christians, usually both in consecrated life, so a female consecrated virgin and a male ascetic, so their version of monks at the time, they would live together and be legally married, living in the same household, but no sex, not having a physical relationship. There's this term called mui era sub intraductus, and it meant female virgins who were living with priests. The Shepherd of Hermes is in the early second century. This theology of celibacy following Jesus and Mary's example became so popular to the extent that people like St. Irenaeus even condemned the practice because he saw it as causing scandal. Outsiders who are not Christian will probably assume that these people who are supposed to be virgins could be having sex, and he actually blames it on the Gnostic heresy for starting up this idea of spiritual marriages. But I disagree with him. I blame Mary and Joseph's marriage as the catalyst to all of this. People being so excited, freely choosing this, it's a concept that's so hard for us to understand living in the 21st century, but in the ancient world there were so many other religions and cultures doing the same thing. The Romans had Vestal virgins, which were priestesses of the goddess Vesta. The Babylonians also had a type of celibate marriage where they were married, but they were not having children. Going into the third century, spiritual marriages became increasingly popular in the Western and Eastern Church. Saint Cyprian of Carthage, like Irenaeus, is also infuriated, so angry about this. The Council of Nicaea actually forbids spiritual marriages, but it still continued. They just wanted to have guy roommates. I agree with the concept of spiritual marriages. I would be in a spiritual marriage. Single priests and female virgins just wanted to be best friends with each other. Why is living with roommates so controversial? My whole point with this is to just illustrate how popular and stoked Christians were in the early church to practice celibacy. Female virgins, monks, priests, everyone was so excited about it. It was something the Christians were choosing to emulate scripture. So there were large numbers of priests and bishops and deacons in the early church hundreds of years before the celibacy mandate who some even left their wives upon being consecrated into the priesthood or into the deacon order. And in a few minutes, we'll talk about the council, which allowed them to stay married after becoming a priest, but you had to live as brother and sister and to not have sex with your wife anymore. Something really intense I want to read, and I'm going to put it up on the screen, what the bishop is saying during an ordination ceremony for a priest. You ought anxiously to consider again and again what sort of burden this is which you are taking upon you of your own accord. Up to this, you are free. You may still, if you choose, turn to the aims and desires of the world. But if you receive this order, 
it will no longer be lawful to turn back from your purpose. You will be required to continue in the service of God and with his assistance to observe chastity and to be bound forever in the ministrations of the altar to serve who is to reign. So I want to read this passage from Clement of Alexandria's book called Stromata, and he is a Christian writing in the second century. He was born in the year 150 and died in 215, so the second half of the second century. So this is in Stromata, book three, chapter one, section four. Our view is that we welcome as blessed the state of abstinence from marriage in those to whom this has been granted by God. We admire monogamy and the high standing of single marriage, holding that we ought to share suffering with one another and bear one another's burdens, lest Anyone who thinks he stands securely should himself fall. It is of second marriage that the apostle says, so the apostle Paul, if you burn, marry. I really love this passage because so many people will argue that because we have celibate priests and we value celibacy in different orders of nuns and monks, that the church is against sex. But this early Christian theologian is saying that both are so virtuous and so amazing. So after uplifting and arguing for celibacy and chastity, he also has this to say, All the same, the church fully receives the husband of one wife, whether he be priest or deacon or layman, supposing always that he uses his marriage blamelessly, and such a one shall be saved in the begetting of children. Later on, Clement becomes a heretic and joins the Gnostic sect. But then later in life, he says that the ideal of a Christian is to marry and have children because it's something so difficult and it builds more virtue being in a household. Particularly, he says that the married man will have to conquer temptations that a single man wouldn't. Exactly like St. Paul who says that if you're married, you're going to be encountering more troubles. So now I'm going to read from Tertullian living in Africa. He was born in the year 160, so in the second century church, and he was a contemporary of Clement of Alexandria and Irenaeus. So again, this is in the second century church, and he's musing about how so many Christians are choosing to be celibate. How many men, therefore, and how many women in ecclesiastical orders owe their position to continents who have preferred to be wedded to God, who have restored the honor of their flesh, and who have already dedicated themselves as sons of the future age, which is referring to heaven, by slaying in themselves the concupiscence of lust, and that whole propensity which could not be admitted within paradise, whence it is presumable that such as shall wish to be received within paradise ought at last to begin to cease from that thing from which paradise is intact. What's interesting though is Tertullian was married, but he did have his wife promise him that if he died, she wouldn't get remarried because he wanted her to experience the beauty and excitement of singlehood and celibacy. And I super relate to this because I have been single for the majority of my life. I do not easily get into relationships. I've only been in a few. And I have enjoyed doing so much ministry, dedicating myself solely to the ministry through my YouTube channel. I lived in Thailand doing missionary work at my college. And I found so much joy being single focused on God and not getting distracted from a relationship because it's true you have to dedicate so many hours and hours investing in the other person and that's time that previously I would have devoted to prayer and Bible study and so it's harder in a relationship focusing on God and I think a lot of people wouldn't admit that and they'd say that their partner pushes them closer to God. Yes we have spiritual activities together but I totally get and have encompassed the beauty and the strength, the passion and the freedom in being single 
and only focused on ministry, only focused on God, which is what the priests and bishops and nuns and monks get to experience in Catholic Christianity. And like I was saying before, what Tertullian is saying, it's a great example where you can value marriage, value sex, at the same time as you're valuing singlehood, it's not a dichotomy. The church has always uplifted and valued both. Then he talks about how there are loads of examples of even heathens valuing celibacy. So that's the name, heathens. He labels non-Christians. They had a tradition where even in a wedding, the bridesmaid had to be a virgin to wish good luck on the couple. Then he lists off pagan orders of virgins, just showing that it's a cultural thing at the time. So there are Vesta's virgins and Junos at the town of Achaea, Apollos among the Delphians and Minervas and Dianas, male and female priests of the famous Egyptian bull, woman dedicated to the African service, etc., etc. So it wasn't just a Christian culture thing, it was the entire ancient world as a whole. So then Eusebius in Demonstrations of the Gospel, Book 1, Chapter 9, he was born in the 3rd century in the year 263 and then he died in 339. So the second half of the 3rd century, he's writing this about celibacy in Christianity. So he's comparing the Old Covenant to the New Covenant and he's questioning why if the Israelites were keenly concerned with marriage and reproduction while we to some extent disregard it. So he's making this blanket statement that celibacy is such a thing. They're so convinced the world's going to end soon and Jesus is going to come back soon that it doesn't even make sense to have children to a lot of people in Christianity at the time. So here's the entire quotation. If we claim that the gospel teaching of our Savior Christ bids us worship God as did the men of old, and the pre-Mosaic men of God, and that our religion is the same as theirs, and our knowledge of God the same, why were they keenly concerned with marriage and reproduction, while we to some extent disregarded it? Why are they recorded as propagating God with animal sacrifices, while we are forbidden to do so, and are told to regard it as impious. And then he is quoting St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 to kind of answer his own question. It seems like he's addressing questions that were being asked. So he's explaining that St. Paul's passage about singlehood, about celibacy, is the reason that so many people at that time were wanting to be single and valuing chastity and singlehood. He continues, And this explanation of the ancient men of God begetting children cannot be said to apply to the Christians today, which is in the third century again, when by God's help through our Savior's gospel teaching, we can see with our own eyes many peoples and nations in city and country and field all hastening together and united in running to learn the godly course of the teaching of the gospel. This is my favorite part. For I am glad to say, we are able to provide teachers and preachers of the word of holiness, free from all ties of life and anxious thoughts. And in our day, these men are necessarily devoted to celibacy, that they may have leisure for higher things. He then talks about how he believes that even the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, he believes they gave up having sex after they had children to enjoy being celibate and having a single devotion to God, not being distracted. And then he also completely agrees with the Philo of Alexandria interpretation where Moses definitely stopped having sex with Zipporah after experiencing the burning bush. Eusebius is then quoting the verse in 1 Timothy 3 about bishops and deacons being the husband of only one wife. He says, for a bishop, says the scripture, must be the husband of but one wife. Yes, it is fitting that those in the priesthood and occupied in the service of God should abstain after ordination from the intercourse of marriage to all who have not undertaken this wondrous priesthood 
scripture almost completely gives way. So this is in the late third, early fourth century where he's saying that it's fitting that after becoming a priest, the priest should stop having sex with his wife, even though they were married before he became a priest. So then we have St. Cyril of Jerusalem's Catechetical Lecture 12, Chapter 25. For if he who fulfills the office of a priest of Jesus abstains from a wife, how should Jesus himself be born of man and woman? And then the context around that, I don't care about that much. The point is, he's just saying that people who are priests abstain from a wife. Again, this is in the beginning of the fourth century and soon we're going to get in the councils, local and ecumenical around that time that were mandating these things. Saint Jerome also writing in the fourth century, he says, even though they may have wives, they cease to be husbands. Talking about how priests not only will stop having sex, but stop being married upon becoming a priest. Which totally makes sense because his contemporary, Saint Augustine, had uh, someone who is not a wife, but a long, long-term partner, and they stopped being together once he became a priest. So then we have Saint Epiphanius in his Against Heresies, chapter 48, section 9. This is a huge document. So he says, the Holy Church respects the dignity of the priesthood to such a point that she does not admit to the deacons, the priesthood, or the bishop, not even the subdeacons, anyone still living in marriage and begetting children. She accepts only him who, if married, gives up his wife or has lost her by death, especially in those places where the ecclesiastical canons are strictly attended to. And then he does mention that there are exceptions in the church, particularly in the Eastern Church, which as the Catechism said at the very beginning of this video, even to this day, they have married priests in the Eastern Orthodox Church and in Eastern Catholic churches. Another exception is if a family is converting into Catholicism where the husband is a priest in the Anglican or Episcopal Church. So the family researches into church history, is so stoked, finds out that Catholicism is the original church that Jesus established. Unlike a lot of Protestant pastors who lose their job and are really struggling financially for their family to all enter the Catholic Church, a Anglican or Episcopal priest can transition into being a Catholic priest. And this actually happened to the girl I sponsored into becoming a Catholic this year. Her sister's family recently converted from Episcopal to Catholic and they have five kids together and now he's a Catholic priest. So I think that's really, really beautiful and special because I've gotten so many messages and comments from families trying to convert where they don't know how they're going to make it financially because his job is a Protestant pastor. So I think it's really, really beautiful and sweet that when it comes to Anglican and Episcopal priests and their families, they can enter into the Catholic priesthood. Saint Epiphanius is also living in the fourth century. He was born in the year 310 and died in 403. Something else, very interesting letter from Athanasius. It's a letter to an Egyptian monk named Dracontius, and this is in the 4th century. He was born in 296 and then lived until 373. Many bishops have not contracted matrimony, while on the other hand, monks have become fathers. <laughs> again, again, we see bishops who have children and monks who have no thoughts of having posterity. So some people are choosing celibacy, some people are not. At this time, it was optional. So we're going to go into the fourth century councils, which were making it illegal for priests to be married. And it was kind of a gradual thing. You'll see. So number one, the apostolic constitution, number six, and this is from chapter seven. So it banned getting married multiple times. And this is talking about if your wife died. So if you are a priest or if you are a deacon, your wife dies and then you marry another wife and then she dies and then you marry another wife, which seems like such a strange concept, but I assume because of childbirth, it was really common where there were so many priests 
who, not because of divorce, but because of death, were remarrying multiple times. So this Apostolic Constitution 6 is banning that. And it says specifically, we have already said that a bishop, a priest, and a deacon, when they are constituted, must be only once married, whether their wives be alive or whether they be dead. And that it is not lawful for them, if they are unmarried, when they are ordained, to be married afterwards. Or if they be then married, to marry a second time, but to be content with that wife, which they had when they came to ordination. So they're saying you got to experience marriage at one point, then your wife died, but be really happy and be excited to be celibate now. Kind of the same idea that Tertullian was sharing with his wife. Also, this was so cool how much they value teachers and lectors and cantors almost as an entire ministry of the church. So important that in these councils and laws about marriage, they're included as a lot of these things they're also subject to. That's how important these positions were. We also appoint that the ministers and singers and readers and porters shall be only once married. So again, if your wife died or your husband died and then you got remarried, not allowed. But if they enter into the clergy before they were married, we permit them to marry if they have an inclination to do so. So unlike priests and deacons, if you're a scripture reader or you're leading music at church, you are allowed to be married after you started that position. And then they had a whole order of deaconesses, which is completely separate from the order of deacons. So don't get that confused. But the order of deaconesses, let the deaconesses be a pure virgin or at least a widow who has been but once married faithful and well-esteemed. So from the apostolic constitution conclusion, if you are a priest, bishop, deacon, like it says in 1 Timothy 5, only married one time, even if wife dies, not allowed to get married after you become a priest or a deacon or bishop. Next, there are three local councils, so not the entire church, but regions of the church, namely the Council of Elvira in Spain in the year 306, and then the Councils of Arles and Inquira in the year 314. There is an exception here for deacons, but that got later removed. This forbids any marriage after ordination, even if you had never been married, and even further, it forbids having sex once you become a priest. So if you were married before becoming a priest, you have to live as brother and sister with your wife or just not be married anymore. Then in the Council of Nicaea in 325, and to be clear, this is an ecumenical council, meaning the entire church, including the Eastern church, which has not been having priestly celibacy as a rule. An attempt was made for the entire church to take the Spanish council to forbid any marriage of a priest or deacon even if they've never been married and to not allow sex in the marriage after becoming a priest or deacon or bishop. It was this guy Hoseus Bishop of Cordova where he attempted to make this in the universal church which would include the eastern church that did not have this as part of their tradition and still doesn't. But then this guy named Pophenitus argued against it and won. And this is all recorded by Socrates of Constantinople. So in the Eastern church during this time, don't wanna forget about our Orthodox brothers and sisters. There was a mandate that bishops had to be celibate. And it's kind of made sense because they drew a lot of their bishops out of monasteries. So they were already celibate. And to this day, bishops in the Eastern Orthodox Church are celibate. Something super random that I found interesting. In Russia in 1274, marriages of priests and deacons were obligatory. So you had to be married if you were going to become part of religious life which is how a lot of Protestant churches are. They require ministers and youth ministers to be married. So then in the Latin rite of the church, priestly marriages were prohibited by Pope Sircius in AD 385. The Latin church took the third and last step 
the absolute prohibition of clerical marriage, including even the lower orders. This belongs to the next period, but we will here briefly anticipate the result. Priestly marriage was first prohibited by Pope Sircius in AD 385, then by Pope Innocent I in 402, Leo I in 440, Gregory I in 590, and by provincial synods of Carthage, Toledo, Orleans, Orange, Arles, Ag, and Grunda. The great teachers of the Nicene and post-Nicene age, Jerome, Augustine, and Chrysostom, by their extravagant laudations of the superior sanctity of virginity, gave this legislation the weight of their authority. So I want to end by reading a quote from an ex-Catholic, this medieval history scholar named Dr. Dillinger. And this is something he wrote in a letter to an Anglican friend, and I'm getting this from the New Advent Encyclopedia, which is linked below. You in England cannot understand how completely ingrained it is into our people that a priest is a man who sacrifices himself for the sake of his parishioners. He has no children of his own, in order that all the children in the parish may be his children. His people know that his small wants are supplied and that he can devote all his time and thought to them. They know that it is quite otherwise with the married pastors of the Protestants. The pastor's income may be enough for himself, but it is not enough for his wife and children also. In order to maintain them, he must take other work Literary or scholastic, only a portion of his time can be given to his people, and they know that when the interests of his family and those of his flock collide, his family must come first and his flock second. In short, he has a profession or trade rather than a vocation. He has to earn a livelihood. In almost all Catholic congregations, a priest who married would be ruined all his influence would be gone. The people are not at all ready for so fundamental a change and the circumstances of the clergy do not admit it. It is a fatal resolution. So obviously this is talking about when the Anglican church was considering bringing in married priests. Okay, so this is everything I wanted to share in this video. I researched all of this when I was manic, so let me know if you think it is too much, scattered, not organized, or it was a really good video.